Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Ibrahim Aude. Palestine, occupation, ethnic cleansing and resistance. And we have uh, Professor Jess Ghanam from University of California, San Francisco to help us talk about this uh, topic. So welcome Professor Ghanam and uh, welcome to Hawaii, welcome to the program. And uh, we wanted to know first uh, what uh, you do in your profession and also um, how do you mix your profession with your activism and your interest in the topic and especially in the place Palestine. Well first I want to thank you Professor Ade for uh, inviting me and say aloha to the people of Hawaii. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here and to be on your show and to be able to speak about this uh, important, uh, important topic. Um, I have actually been working in Palestine now for more than 15 years. I'm in the Department of Psychiatry at UCSF and for the last 15 years I've been studying and looking at the traumatic effects of uh, war and occupation on Palestinian men, women and children. And uh, we've been uh, doing a couple of things. First of all, looking at the long-term negative effects of post-traumatic stress on Palestinian children. And then secondly, setting up community clinics in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously this has been a very big challenge to be able to do this because being able to do any kind of activism and work in Palestine right now with such a uh, significant escalation of the mm -hmm. occupation has been very difficult. And in terms of how it integrates and works with my activism life, I mean, you know, as people of conscience, as Palestinians, we never make the separation that they do in this country, you know, between public life and private life mm -hmm. or activism and private life. Uh, I've always been very interested in uh, bringing these two things together because it's, you know, it's obviously it's very difficult to separate mm -hmm one's political life mm -hmm. from one's activist life from one's professional life mm -hmm. we don't do that in other parts of the world i yes. guess that just <laughs> that just happens in in this country unfortunately yeah. edward said talks about uh, the public intellectual also and he was uh, public intellectual par excellence and i'm glad that uh, many of uh, the professors uh, are that too, uh, especially those who are interested in the uh, Middle East, uh, th that region of the world. Yeah. Absolutely, because you know this happens to be one of the areas in the world where we have at times I think an intellectual blackout, mm -hmm. that uh, it seems to be a black hole in the academy, the Middle East and Palestine, Iraq, things like mm -hmm. that, where it's okay to have consciousness about other parts of the world, mm -hmm. but when it comes about Palestine we seem to in the academy lose our sense of mm -hmm. awareness and, and justice and uh, sense of consciousness about how to do mm -hmm. our analysis about what's happening in Palestine. And, and I think you would know this in anyone who's been to Palestine, all you have to do is go to Palestine once mm -hmm. and see with your own eyes the reality on the ground. You come back and you, you have to make it part of your mm -hmm. life. You have mm -hmm. to make it part of your existence. You have to make it part of your uh, your feet in the world and what you do every day because it's such a powerful experience. Yeah, and in fact, uh, I know of um, a number of uh, individuals, uh, Americans, who have done so, including uh, American Jews, and they have come uh, really changed and uh, they're supportive of Palestinian rights, national and human rights, and so on. So it's just a matter of uh, standing, where do you stand on issues of human rights, international law, and so forth. Um, when we uh, talk about uh, occupation, what do we exactly mean by occupation? I mean, this uh, um, we might think of it as uh, something innocuous, uh, the term occupation. So in terms of what you have seen in, the Palest uh, in Palestine, um, how would you describe that? Well, y you know, you're right, uh, Brahim, that the, the word occupation gets thrown a lot around mm. in, the, in the media mm. and all the time. And it, you hear it so many times, you think, well, what's the big deal? The United States is occupying Iraq. Uh, Israel is occupying Palestine. It doesn't seem like such a big deal. But the reality on the ground for Palestinians, for Iraqis, or, or for anybody that's being occupied, wherever they may be, it has a profound 
impact on every single aspect of your day-to-day -day living. Mm -hmm. When we say that Palestinians are being occupied by Israel or under Israeli occupation, we're saying that there's nothing a Palestinian does from the time they wake up in the morning till the time they go to bed, and even while they're asleep, that doesn't come under the control of the Israeli control machine. In fact, we, we can even use the word the matrix of control. Mm -hmm. A Palestinian cannot go from point A to point B without being controlled by the Israeli military. This can take the form of checkpoints. This can take the form of the apartheid wall. This can take the form on restrictions of movement from the north of the Gaza Strip to the south of the Gaza Strip or the, wet, or the north of the West Bank to the south. So movement is restricted. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Palestinians, I mean, you and I can get up and we can get on a plane and go to Maui or we can go to the mainland. A Palestinian living in Ramallah cannot just go to Nablus or cannot just go mm -hmm. to Hebron and for sure cannot go to Tel Aviv or to Gaza. There are significant restrictions mm -hmm. on every Palestinian's ability to move. Mm -hmm. And of course we see the restrictions on, from a more psychological and, you know, uh, perspective, we see the attempt of the occupation to erase our memory as Palestinians, mm -hmm. which I think, you know, there's a military form of the occupation, but the psychological form, which is continuing to control people and get them to forget our connection to our land, our connection to each mm -hmm. other, our connection to our history, our connection to our language. So the matrix of control that an occupier uses is profound from the time you wake up till the time you go to bed. You know, for many years during the Intifada, you know this, whether it was the first or the second Intifada, Palestinian children were not allowed to go to school. Mm -hmm. So they controlled the school system. Yeah. They controlled the health system. They control every single aspect of your life. And I think most Americans may not fully understand when they're watching the corporate news on TV how deep and profound this occupation is on the day-to-day -day life of a Palestinian. Mm -hmm. Because you have to imagine that every single breath you take is formed by the occupation. Yeah. This, in fact, uh, was brought home uh, to uh, an audience uh, last night uh, at the Capilani Community College. Uh, and it was about experiences of Palestinian youth uh, regarding the occupation yeah. itself and uh, there were like uh, clips of uh, movies uh, about uh, you know experiences of the youth in Palestine um, in terms of the wall and the uh, system of control that you uh, spoke of but also there were uh, two students who are exchange students uh, teenagers mm. uh, one from uh, Gaza the uh, student uh, I don't know, maybe 16, 17 year mm -hmm. old, and one uh, from uh, Nablus. Mm. And they spoke elo eloquently about their particular experiences and how they grew up, etc. And they really uh, were riveting in terms of uh, what they had to say, etc. And the people, uh, the audience, I mean, really responded to that, and there was a very lively discussion and so on. So it was great uh, to see that uh, this word and this narrative is coming out more so than before because, uh, as we know, the uh, Zionists um, and the pro-Israeli lobby in this country and elsewhere would like to have uh, their um, narrative not only dominant but the only narrative, Absolutely. you see, that exists. But uh, this is breaking uh, down a little bit now. So do you find this in your experiences when you talk to... Um, people um, in the United States, for well, instance? Well, it's interesting that you say that because I have an a interesting story to tell mm. about that. So it's, it's not that interesting. It's a, very, it's a very disturbing story, which is if you watch NBC or ABC or CNN, whatever, and if, there, if something happens in Palestine, for example, and they want to show both sides of the story, so to mm -hmm. speak, because they want to be balanced. Mm -hmm. They want to show the Israeli side and the Palestinian side. This just happened last week, too. Mm -hmm. So on the Israeli side, they'll bring the Israeli ambassador, mm -hmm. let's say, to the UN or to the United States, and he'll give the Israeli analysis about why 
the 120 Palestinians were killed in Gaza. Then on the Palestinian side, they'll use a terrorism expert mm -hmm. who's not Palestinian, who in fact may be Israeli for all we know, mm -hmm. but they don't even allow a Palestinian to speak on behalf of, of themselves, of yeah. ourselves. Mm -hmm. And in this mind, this is a form of the occupation that we mm -hmm. see even in this country today, that Palestinians are not even allowed, unless we demand it, which we do, to speak our own story in our own voice, in our own words. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this can happen last night at the community center is fantastic. We're, we're starting to get going on this, but it's, it's mm -hmm. very difficult. Yes. And I think mm -hmm. people who are watching the show in Hawaii need to understand that, yes, Palestinians exist. We have a very deep, important story to tell. Our story, unfortunately, is not unique because if anyone has struggled for self-determination, whether it's people indigenous to Hawaii, whether it's people, uh, indigenous people in the, you know, on the mainland, indigenous Indians in the mainland, or anybody who's struggled for, under the, the thumb of colonial occupation has told the same story. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, we're still struggling, of course, but our story is a very similar story to other stories. Yeah. This is um, uh, an interesting uh, discussion, and uh, you were um, giving a talk. Uh, you gave a talk uh, before this show, yes. like two, three hours, uh, at the Department of English. Uh, and um, I like that point that uh, you gave in terms of uh, representation, because you know, <clears throat> um, in terms of uh, oriental uh, orientalism, yes. orientalizing or deorientalizing. It's the question of uh, what you just said, the representation, and it occurs in two forms, representation. One is who is representing you in terms of giving a narrative about you, and the other thing, how, they, how that narrative goes. Exactly. You know? So two kinds of notions of representation. And so um, I'm glad that uh, there are more uh, Palestinians and pro-Palestinians who are giving a different kind of narrative, a different kind of representation. Absolutely, yeah. because uh, one of the biggest things that an occupier or a colon colonizer does, they want to dominate and take over mm -hmm. your, your narrative. Mm -hmm. They want to co-opt your story, spin it in mm -hmm. some way, and tell you and the rest of the world what your story right, should be. Right, yeah. And um, it's, it's tragic, but this has been the oppress story for many, mm -hmm. many, many, many years. Right, yeah. So the first step in kind of resistance mm -hmm. is speaking. Yes, yes, that's, uh, that's uh, very, uh, very much so. Um, since we're talking about representation, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go to a clip. Um, okay. this, is, this comes from um, a forum we did at Hawaiian Studies. Uh -huh. uh, I was a part of the forum, plus uh, Haunani K. Trask, who's an uh, indigenous uh, Hawaiian and uh, a professor at, uh, the, at Hawaiian Studies. So we'll watch that uh, clip and then we can open it up. Okay. The title of my talk is Hawaii and Palestine Colonized Countries and Murdered Nations. What has been occurring in Palestine is part of what has happened in the Americas, in Africa, in Australia, and other countries where white settlers have taken up residence. That is the expulsion of the native and the settlement by the colonizer. Zionists are doing to the Palestinians what the Americans have done to American Indians and what they are now doing to Hawaiians to ethnically cleanse the indigenous population. Like Palestinians, Hawaiians have been invaded, our sovereignty has been destroyed, and our country has been swallowed up by an imperialist behemoth. Our people are now subjugated by blood quantum definitions that impose the logic of elimination. As with the United States, Israel now represents, in the striking words of author Susan Nathan, and I quote, a compulsive, racist, colonial hunger for land and resources, end quote. Israeli historian Anita Shapiro thus claims that Jews, quote, have a right to Palestine, which is grounded in an organic connection 
with that land that links their blood and the soil. Israelis following in the footsteps of American Puritans consider themselves part of a redeemer nation. Of course, Jews have no such organic connections to Palestine any more than the Puritans did to Indian country. 2,000 years of non-Jewish settlement in Palestine and 2,000 years of Jews outside Palestine prove the falsehood of any historical Jewish right to Palestine. The only organic connection is the one between indigenous people and their land. And Israelis are no more organically connected to Palestine than settlers in Hawaii are organically connected to Hawaii. Well, <clears throat> just here you have a flavor of uh, what's happening in uh, Hawaii as regards uh, the question of indigeneity whether it's Hawaiian, Palestinian, or what have you. So any comments on what Taunani K was talking about? Well, I think what she said was very profound and very deep. And I can tell you in, in the words that she was speaking in relation to indigenous Hawaiians and their experience of being colonized by white settlers, she's speaking the same language. She has the same narrative. And she painfully experiences the same things that every Palestinian experiences in historic Palestine. So the fact that she is able to offer that kind of analysis makes me feel somewhat optimistic about Hawaii and makes me feel somewhat optimistic about what, what's happening in this country in general because one of the things that I think she's providing and perhaps even shows like this are providing are context. Mm -hmm. Because every time you hear about Palestine on the corporate media, all it is is these, it's like these angry Palestinians. Why are these Palestinians so angry all the time? They're throwing things and the images, the narratives that are created on the corporate media of Palestinians are just people who are just angry and throwing things. Mm -hmm. But what about the context? Mm -hmm. What about a people who have a deep organic connection to the land that goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years, who have been confronted by this ugly, grotesque form of colonization in the form of Zionism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what she says is, is, is very profound. And, you know, I'm sure indigenous Hawaiian peoples understand this struggle as well as every Palestinian does. We are struggling against the same form of, uh, you know, racist domination. And this kind of fantasy that I think white settlers have, mm -hmm. you know, whether they believe it's from the Bible or it's God given or whatever that, you know, this is theirs and they will do anything to keep it. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of racist, uh, basically white supremacy idea that uh, oppressed people all over the world have, have needed to confront for a long time. And, you know, she's saying something which is, uh, is ringing true for, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. oppressed people everywhere. Yeah. In fact, it's interesting uh, how Nani K quotes uh, Susan Nathan. Yes. And uh, Susan Nathan is an Israeli. Uh, and, uh, but she's an Israeli who moved to a Palestinian village. Right, yeah. yeah. But uh, the thing is that uh, here you have an Israeli Jew saying this about the state of Israel. Right. Yeah. So it's uh, kind of interesting. Uh, that perspective needs to be uh, discussed and uh, uh, debated um, along with the um, dominant uh, narrative of the Israeli state and the But you, you see creation. this uh, in the Israeli press more than you see it here. Absolutely. And this is the thing that I think is hard for Americans to realize because, again, it's the forbidden topic here. Mm -hmm. In politics, we call it the third rail. Mm -hmm. It's very forbidden. You can't talk about Palestine. You know, the McCain, Clinton, Obama uh, platform on Israel is exactly the same. They may differ on NAFTA, healthcare, Iraq, whatever, but on Palestine, you see no difference among mm -hmm. these Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. Yet, if you look in the Israeli press, you will see a very active debate about these very issues, about the, uh, the horrific effects of Zionism, the racist nature of a Zionist colonist entity like Israel. You'll actually see this taken on by Israelis. Mm -hmm. Who are, who are able to do this in the Israeli press, you'll never see it 
here mm -hmm. in the New York Times, right, in the yeah. Washington Post, the LA Times. You won't even see it in the, in the papers here. And I think we as Americans are frankly asleep. Mm -hmm. we're, we're asleep. We're, we're at the shopping malls. We're going into debt. We're losing our homes mm -hmm. while these things are happening, while $12 billion a year is being spent a month is being spent in Iraq while the United States is giving three to five to seven billion dollars a year to Israel. Our school systems are falling apart. Our health care system is falling apart. People cannot get a good, you know, education here. So the inability of most Americans to kind of wake up to this is really yeah. tragic. Uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> there's a debate in Congress and a bill uh, that they're going to vote on um, that will in uh, maybe tomorrow they're going yes. to vote on, that will increase uh, the aid to Israel by maybe 5 or 7 percent, I'm not sure, yes. but something uh, yes. uh, on that order. And yeah. you have African Americans in Louisiana two years after Katrina, mm -hmm. you have 100,000 African Americans denied a right to return to their homes who are not funded for this by the U.S. government, who are basically treated as uh, inhuman people species mm -hmm. and yet this country is willing to give Israel billions of dollars a year to continue its racist apartheid practices against Palestinians and another 12 billion dollars a month to further this occupation in Iraq and it, it seems like Americans are barely uh, have any consciousness or awareness of this. Yeah and then uh, if one hears that uh, one would imagine that a question would be asked as why? Why are we doing this? What's going on? You know, and that might like uh, begin to unpack uh, yes. a lot of stuff that's uh, are you know in, in terms of dirty linen or something in the closet. You know, <laughs> hopefully no, no dirty linen in the closet. But anyway, <laughs> so um, yeah, that's that's um, an, an interesting uh, thing. I think. Uh, um, but uh, the other question about, uh, you said, the debates in Israel about this, uh, if they are, done, uh, you know, done here uh, you, uh, by non-Jews or non-Israelis, uh, you'd um, have a charge uh, of anti-Semitism exactly. leveled uh, at you. Whereas, uh, you know, Israelis doing that, it's okay, I suppose, well, they for get some called, people. They get but they called, can, they called, they're, they're called self-hating Jews, Jews so, yeah. and they're mm. also called anti-Semitic. Right. Oh, well. So we we have uh, colleagues in the United States who are Jewish Americans who are anti-Zionist, and it's important for Hawaiians to know that. And I'm sure if they watch your show, they know what an anti-Zionist is. But you have anti-Zionist Jews throughout the United States who are willing to speak up against this uh, ugly form of occupation that Israel is engaged in in Palestine. And they too get labeled as anti-Semitic. Yeah, yeah. And uh, self-hating Jews and all, all of that. that. Yeah. So it's an interesting thing. So why don't we go to uh, okay. Haunani, uh, another clip uh, from uh, that uh, panel that uh, happened on uh, March 5th, last okay. Wednesday. We go that and then we'll discuss. Zionist enterprise, like the American enterprise, is intimately tied to genocide. Regarding the international community, the Oslo Agreement left Palestinians, according to one of their great spokespersons, Edward Said, absolutely nothing. As with the much heralded apology bill that the United States gave to Native Hawaiians for the overthrow of our native government, the theft of our native lands and the banning of our native language, we too received nothing. Hawaiians remain landless and Palestinians continue to live in Bantustans. Finally, as occupied countries, Hawaii and Palestine are destined for extinction. Make no mistake about this. You could see that in the film, and you can see it right here in Hawaii. The purpose is to extinguish the native people. The purpose is to extinguish the native people. I was uh, thinking, uh, in fact, about uh, what you were saying before, uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, 
these are uh, the, the, the Zionist uh, enterprise, in fact, is a colonial project, just like any other colonial project. So any more comments? On oh, that? yeah, I think it's, uh, it, this is such an important point, Brahim, because, again, in terms of the mythology and the Zionist American pro-Israeli narrative about Palestine, want to paint a picture that this is somehow East versus West, mm -hmm. or Muslim versus Christian, or something like a religious thing. Mm -hmm. And based on what she said, and you know what, what any person with any analysis about Palestine knows, that it's not about religion. It's about a colonial occupation, an occupier and occupied. The Palestinians are occupied, and Palestinians resisting this occupation by as many means as they can. And I would just disagree with one thing she said. Mm -hmm. she, when she quoted Edward Said, and I, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what Edward Said has said, mm -hmm. but he said after Oslo it, le it left us with nothing. Actually, it's worse than nothing. Mm -hmm. I would be happy if it le left us with <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Because it, le it left us with less than nothing. Oh, yes. It mm -hmm. left us in the negative because what many people don't realize is one of the biggest catastrophes of the Oslo agreements and the Declaration of Principles in 1993 was from 1993 basically up until now we have seen the most rapid expansion of Jewish only settlements in the West Bank in the history mm -hmm. of the Zionist project. Mm -hmm. I mean before Oslo there were maybe 80 to 90,000 Israelis Jewish citizens living in settlements in the West Bank in Jerusalem. The Israelis signed an agreement saying they would stop the settlements and stop settlement growth. So where are we today? From mm -hmm. 80 to 90,000? Today as we speak, Ibrahim, there are almost 500,000 Jewish settlers living in Jerusalem and the West Bank. Mm -hmm. They are illegal under international law. They are illegal under the United Nations. They are condemned universally, even Condoleezza Rice, mm -hmm who is, you know, a big apologist for Israel, calls them unhelpful. Mm -hmm. So what Oslo did was basically support the, the, the project for colonial expansion. Mm -hmm. And she is very right. The, the colonizer has an appetite, and that appetite is for land and resources. Yeah. And that's what they're doing in Palestine. Yeah. In fact, uh, it was Saeed, uh, <clears throat> when uh, he was, um, you know, with the... Um, agreement uh, 1993 Oslo and the signing uh, the yes. Rose Garden he was invited to the Rose Garden and he declined saying that uh, no there's nothing to celebrate this is the final dispossession of the Palestinian people and uh, he was right he was uh, in many right. ways in he many was ways abso yeah. absolutely right yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, interesting also in terms of uh, the colonial project and uh, the um, importance of the narrative, the colonial narrative to that uh, project. And uh, you can find it in literature, you can find it uh, you know, in uh, all kinds of um, yes. forms like the news and so forth. And um, I uh, uh, still remember um, Edward Said's uh, discussion of um, the novel Daniel Doranda yeah. and showing like even from the um, 19th century uh, before uh, anybody was thinking about the modern Zionist movement uh, there were uh, like uh, that notion um, in, in terms of uh, the right of the Jews to go back to Palestine occurring in uh, English novels. You it's know, striking. You know. So it's, uh, this is something that reminds me of what you were talking about, that the occupation, that the narrative uh, is very important to the occupation, and the occupation is not only military, but uh, takes many other forms. I think it's yeah. the most important and most powerful aspect of the occupation. The military aspects are, are not that complicated. And in my mind, the most powerful aspects of any occupation is the control of the discourse, the narrative, the history, mm -hmm. and the psychological aspects. Because, yeah. you know, I mentioned this in my talk, the first thing that the Zionists did in 1948, when they dispossessed, when they ethnically cleansed and removed 800,000 Palestinians from Palestine, about 80% of our population, mm -hmm. one of the first things they did was take down 
the signs to the villages written in Arabic, mm -hmm. they either took them down and destroyed them, or they renamed these Arab cities that had been there for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousand years, and, re and gave them Hebrew names, mm -hmm. as if just the removal of a sign, a village name, is enough to completely erase an entire people mm -hmm. and the memory from their connection from the land. And in my mind, I think that's the most important thing. We see it here in Hawaii mm -hmm. with indigenous Hawaiians all the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So it's you can see how powerful this is. Yeah, uh, which um, leads me to ask about uh, the organization that uh, you belong to, which is Al Auda, and in terms of trying to um, counter that particular narrative in many ways, in action as well as, uh, you know, talking about this. So could you tell us about, uh, a little bit about that organization? Sure. And in fact, in, in terms of your activities, uh, professional and otherwise, and how they, um, you know, if you could elaborate on that and how they, like, uh, go together. Sure. It, it's, it's, it's based on a very basic point about these 800,000 Palestinian ref refugees. Because when these 800,000 people were removed forcibly from their land, they became refugees all over the world, in Lebanon, in, in Syria, in Jordan, in Egypt, and in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we know is, number one, the United Nations decided to create, you know, United Nations Resolution 194, which guaranteed the right of all Palestinian refugees to return to their homes. So it's based on the United Nations. It's also based on a notion in international law that any people dispossessed from their homes because of war or occupation are given the inalienable right under international law to return to their homes. Al Auda, which in Arabic means, you know, the return, the return, the return, is an organization that's dedicated to preserving, protecting, and engaging the inalienable right that Palestinian refugees and diaspora have all over the world. It's the right that's protected under the United Nations law, and it's the right that's protected under international law, the right of refugees to be able to return to their homes. Mm -hmm. So this organization, our sole mission is to provide education, is to do whatever we can do within the context of the Americas and Europe and in other parts of the world to educate people about this inalienable right and then to take the steps that we believe we're entitled to to exercise that right mm -hmm. under international law and UN resolution. And by now that, that 800,000 has grown now to about six million people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are a lot of Palestinians who are waiting to return to their mm -hmm. homes and their villages. And, you know, this is a very delicate topic, obviously, mm -hmm. because um, we hear lots of information about this. Whoa, all these Palestinians, what are we going to do? Israel is so small. Mm -hmm. Ah, Well, we've actually done the studies. There's mm -hmm. a very famous Palestinian demographer, uh, Dr. Salman Abu Sitta. No, so no, no, no. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, and you know him. He's actually done the studies and he's found, for example, of the 531 villages that were, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where Palestinians were forcibly removed, 90% remain empty still within Israel today as we speak. Mm -hmm. I have friends in Gaza, for example, who live in a refugee camp in Jabalia. They can look over their fence and see their village still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Less than, you know, how many kilometers away? Mm -hmm. Five kilometers away? Still empty mm -hmm. to this day. Mm -hmm. So his very important demo demographic work showed, despite what the Israeli-American narrative is, oh, poor little Israel, there's no room, that there's actually plenty of room. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of room. 91% of these villages remain empty to this day. And under international law and UN resolution, we believe unequivocally that a just solution to the question of Palestine can only come if Palestinian refugees are given this uh, inalienable right guaranteed under international law. It's, it's ending the occupation and it's allowing Palestinian refugees to return to their land. But then there would be more Arabs, Christian and Muslim than 
Israeli Jews. Uh, oh that's, my God! That's what they would say because they want. Well, to you know, that's it. what white people yeah. said in the yeah. South yeah. when they wanted to get so. rid of slavery. Mm -hmm. They said, "Oh my God, what do you mean? If you free the slaves, then African people will will they will multiply? All this kind of racist, mm -hmm. uh, unconscious racist language and feeling." really comes to the you know comes out of them yeah. they said the same thing about slaves in in the united states during slavery mm -hmm. they said the same thing in south africa oh my god we can't get rid of apartheid what what will happen to the native indigenous south africans that they will go all over i mean you know that's kind mm -hmm. of crazy racist ideology and thinking and they're, they'll say the same thing about palestinians but the, the answer to that is why be afraid mm -hmm. unless you have deep-seated racist feelings about Arabs, Christian Arabs, Muslim Arabs, Palestinians in general, you have, you probably have that kind of anxiety. And my, my, I've said this to my Israeli friends all the time, why, why would you be afraid of democracy? Mm -hmm. You know, why would you be afraid of having someone have their right to return to their home? I feel like you, and I'm speaking to Israeli Jews all the time about this, you should have your right to return and in fact, there is the Jewish law of return. Mm -hmm. And your, your viewers should know that, that a Jew anywhere in the world can go to land owned by my grandfather and buy it and take it and live on it. But I, as a Palestinian, even though my family has been on it for seven, eight hundred years, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's this asymmetry, this racist asymmetry. And that's what all colonizers do. They say, well, we're special. Mm -hmm. We can do it. We're pure if you're a Puritan. Mm -hmm. Or God gave it to us somehow, so we deserve this. And we cannot support that kind of racist ideology anymore. It's not working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, there's this notion of the Jewish state, which uh, doesn't uh, make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. Uh, because uh, how come you can call Israel a Jewish state when you have like at least 20% of the population not Jewish? Yeah. So unless you think about them as subhuman and they don't count, uh, but second that's exactly class what they do, Brahim. Absolutely, yeah, that's my point. So yeah. the point is that if you really want to have a just solution, you have to get rid of this idea and notion, conception of uh, exclusivity. You exclusivity, know. and I would say omnipotence yes. and specialness, because mm -hmm. it's amazing how an occupier feels so entitled to telling the rest of the people how they should live their lives, what they should do, and whose land it is. I mean, it's really extraordinary. It's this idea that I think, you know, we see even in Iraq, because mm -hmm. there's so many similarities, bringing freedom and democracy to Iraq. Mm -hmm. right. even, yeah. even though <laughs> Iraqis in, in Mesopotamia, 6, 000, you know, five to 6,000 years ago, even created the idea of, of democracy yes, that yeah. long ago. But it's right. I mean, Israelis have to face up to this very powerful myth mm -hmm. that they're special. Yeah, and in fact, some uh, Israelis have uh, began uh, have begun to do so, to to do so. Yes. Uh, yeah. In fact, um, what I want to do, I want to go to another clip uh, from the same forum. And this is, um, it's me speaking at the forum, but uh, I just want to sure. make sure that uh, we get the uh, certain points sure. uh, across. And uh, I'm talking about uh, what happened uh, in 1947 to 1949 in terms of the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Okay. In 1947 to 1949, according not to me, but to Israeli researchers, intellectuals, uh, they have concluded that there has been an ethnic cleansing of Palestine uh, by the Zionist movement in those particular years, 1947-1949. Now, I <clears throat> refer you uh, to just one book, uh, and there are many, Ilan Pape, professor of history, Israeli Jew, whose book is titled The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, and it's a 2006 book. 
he had written about that ethnic cleansing of Palestine in an earlier book, uh, I think 92 or something, 93, um, uh, which is called um, The uh, uh, Making of the uh, uh, Arab-Israeli Conflict. So that was 1993, so he talked about that briefly in, 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 in part of the book. Uh, but in doing so, he was relying on Israeli archives, um, you know, Israeli Defense Forces archives and, uh, and Ben-Gurion, uh, who was the first prime minister in Israel, and he was the, basically the uh, prime mover behind the uh, Zionist uh, uh, military forces and political, uh, you know, maneuvering to try and uh, bring about a Zionist state in, in Palestine. And he succeeded because of the ethnic cleansing that uh, Ilan Pape documents thoroughly in his book. Yeah, I just wanted to make that point because it's very important because uh, some people say, oh, it's all propaganda and so on. So, but these are documents, you know, you cannot really uh, say, no, they don't exist or Ben-Gurion didn't say this, so they are not in the Israeli archives. Exactly. Uh, any more on that? Oh, there's a lot to say about that, yeah. Brahim, of course, yeah. but I think you said it very well mm -hmm. there. It doesn't even have to be Elan Pape. Even Zionists are writing about this. Benny Morris, yes, Benny Morris yeah. has written extensively on the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians at mm -hmm. this time. He's not Elan Pape. Mm -hmm. He himself is still a Zionist. Yes. So we call him maybe a soft Zionist, mm -hmm. but he believes in the Zionist project. He believes in what Israel is doing. And he himself has gone into the archives and articulated the very same thing. Palestinians have been there. They've always been there. We ethnically cleanse them, and he documents just like Ilan Pape mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. and is doing. And these are prominent Israelis in the academy. Now, Ilan Pape, unfortunately, was pressured so much he's no longer in yes. Hebrew University. He had to move to the United Kingdom because mm -hmm. he was being so pressured by the Israeli uh, academy. But Benny Morris and other people are still actively writing about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go to another clip okay. uh, of me um, at uh, that uh, forum, uh, just because I want to bring a couple of more points sure. uh, on that. So we'll uh, do that, and uh, then we'll have more discussion. What happened to the clip? Oh, it's not ready. Okay. So we'll go to the clip in a little bit. Okay. I'm told that it's not uh, ready. You know, some uh, yeah. people actually argue with this question of ethnic cleansing. I know uh. that in previous to my, uh, in one of my discussions today here at the university, people have a hard time mm -hmm. with Palestinians mm -hmm. using the word ethnic cleansing. Mm -hmm. And it's always interesting to me mm -hmm. to hear people react very strongly to that because it's a strong word to use. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, on that, uh, people think that, uh, you know, Palestinians were just kicked out, like, you know, uh, they were, and uh, the, the country was ethnic cleansed. But also, there were uh, this plan D that uh, the Haganah had, yes. uh, the main Israeli force, uh, uh, Zionist forces had in 47, 49, uh, really called for also um, getting rid of people, like killing them, you know? Well, we have examples yeah. of that, like yeah. Dir Yassin, right. which was a village in which hundreds of Palestinian mm -hmm. men, women, and children, in fact, were murdered. Yeah. And what's really, really, you know, really tragic about that story, and it's described by Elam Pape mm -hmm. and by Benny Morse, what the Israeli Haganah did was basically go to Dir Yassin, murder its inhabitants, and then they cut off the heads of Palestinian men, women, and they brought the heads back to Jerusalem to show other Palestinians. Now you look and you see what's going to happen. And these to were you. not Muslims. These were Christians. No, no, I mean uh, the people who cut the heads. Yes. They were not Muslims. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because we have this image as only the Muslim. Uh, no, of course. Know, these were yeah. not Muslims. These were, uh, these were Jewish uh, underground. Uh, uh, you know, militia, mm -hmm. because people don't realize this, that before Israel was even a state, mm -hmm. it had an army, mm -hmm. it had a navy, 
it had an underground militia. It was fully armed by the British, mm -hmm. you know, for, for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So this was been in the plans for a very, very long time. And the British time. trained them, and uh, the British uh, uh, forces had uh, uh, Jewish units or Zionist units. Absolutely. Uh, them, and they fought World War II, etc. They were, so they were well trained. The other thing is about the Plan D, it's not like... Uh, these things were, uh, uh, these massacres were haphazard kind of uh, things. They Not were really planned. And in fact, uh, Ilan Pape documents that. Uh, and um, uh, Morris, though, Benny Morris says, uh, no, there was no plan really. But, but I don't know where he stands now after that research that was done well, by Ilan Pape. Yeah. Plan D did exist. Yes. It was implemented. Many Palestinian villages, people were killed and or massacred. Mm -hmm. And this, this thing about, it's so interesting about who controls the language and who mm -hmm. controls the narrative. I actually had a person come and tell me today, oh, you can't use the word ethnic cleansing, mm -hmm. Professor Ghanem, you can't use that mm -hmm. word. And this is part of the hegemony mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the, certain people in the academy right who feel like they own this word mm -hmm. of ethnic cleansing, mm -hmm. that myself as a Palestinian, oh no, you, mm -hmm. I own that word as a, you know, this person happened to be a white South African mm -hmm. who said, well, you can't use that word. Only certain people can yeah. use that word. And I think that's, that's this form of mental colonization yeah. that we yes, see absolutely. very much. But uh, the, the, the point I, I wanna, um, you know, underscore is that it wasn't only expulsion, but ethnic cleansing, yes. I mean, massacres that led to also people uh, being afraid and, uh, you know, they ran away and others were expelled, you know, taken away from their homes and put on trucks and uh, right. or sometimes walk. You yeah, know, but let's be walk. very clear. Mm. It, you know, I've spoken with Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Syria and in the West Bank. Every single one of them says the same thing. Mm -hmm. We were afraid. It was war. We took our keys. We closed our mm -hmm, house because mm -hmm. we knew we were coming back. Mm -hmm. And if you go into the camps in Lebanon and you go into the camps in West Bank, you can talk to refugees. They still have their keys. Mm -hmm. They still have mm -hmm. their deeds. Yeah. We, Why? My family, the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they knew they were coming back. Sure, in two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> and everybody said, we're going to come back in two weeks. Well, that two weeks yeah. turned into two months, two years, yeah. 20 years. Now we're 60 years, so that's back to that concept of al mm -hmm. and uh, the right of return, which in, which in Arabic is haq al the right of return, which is a fundamental principle, really, that we're mm -hmm. talking about. And it's not only a legal principle, but, but it's a principle that is the only thing that will ultimately lead to mm -hmm. a solution to this problem. Yeah, right. So now I'm we told the, uh, the, we tape, now? Uh, the okay. tape is ready. So we'll watch that and go ahead. There has been a, um, a movement uh, of refugees uh, from uh, Palestine, about 750 to 800,000 Palestinians, including me, uh, who, uh, who had to leave. They had to flee because of ethnic cleansing and massacres that have been documented. I'm not making any of, of this thing up. And, you know, as Laura said, that uh, it's incumbent upon us, especially uh, since we are Americans, to figure out what role the United States has in all this and to do research and not be in informed only by our passions and emotions, etc., but also informed by uh, this passionate kind of inquiry about it and let the chips fall where they may. Okay. Yeah. So this is uh, the question of occupation that Palestine, 1948, Palestine has, uh, is an occupied territory. And uh, the proof also is that there are a million plus uh, Palestinian Arabs who are, live in Israel now and they have Israeli citizenship. And they are the ones that say, okay, there is more than a trace of Palestinians in there, where are the rest of those Palestinians? Well, the rest of those Palestinians are in Beirut and uh, Lebanon, Syria, Hawaii. There's a lot of, a number of us here, you know, and um, elsewhere in the continental United States, the Americas, the rest, the diaspora is wide and huge as well. 
Yeah, so I mean, I just wanted to make uh, this point, but uh, I want to go to another clip uh, again uh, of me on that uh, because uh, this, uh, just to finish up that uh, kind of discussion and then we go from there. The fact of the matter, there are two kinds of solutions, it seems to me. I mean, in terms of just logical things. One is if you get out of, uh, get all the colonists, not the settlers, I don't call them settlers because they came to colonize the West, uh, colonize the West Bank. Get all the colonists out of the West Bank and give all of the West Bank and Gaza to the Palestinians. Okay? And then, that doesn't do me any good because I'm a Palestinian from 1948. I'm a refugee from 1948. What are we gonna do with those people? Well, let's implement international law. International law says the rights of refugees to return to their homes. United Nations, uh, has uh, passed a law, uh, I mean a resolution, resolution 194, long time ago, from the beginning, 49, uh, resolution 194 saying the refugees have to return to Palestine. Well, I'm still waiting for the United States to make sure that the Israelis implement that law, uh, that resolution. Okay? I don't want the United States to send troops to, uh, you know, like enforce that resolution, but at least put a little pr bit pressure on Israel to do so. I'm sure the U.S. will not do so for its own particular reasons. But the fact of the matter, this is one uh, solution. The other solution, which is to me more sense, and I will stop after this, um, is to have a state in all of geographic Palestine, where Jews, Christians, and Muslims live together in a democratic fashion. Now, I am not hopeful that either of these things would happen because then that means Zionism and the Zionists would say, okay, no longer are we gonna be an exclusivist kind of society and state. Well, there you go. I mean, um, any more uh, discussion on that? Uh, mm -hmm. Since, uh, you know, your organization is also allowed that and so on. Well, I think you said it very well, Brian, but I would just maybe disagree with one thing you said, because I actually am more optimistic than you are. Mm -hmm. Because uh, having gone to Palestine, I go very frequently to Palestine, I see what's happening on the ground. I also see some factors within Israeli society which are very interesting. Israelis are taking out uh, second and third passports. They're, they're taking their money out of Israeli banks and putting them into European banks. Um, the Israeli kind of infrastructure, because it's built on a lie, mm -hmm. it's built on a colony, a settler racist colony, is beginning to fall apart a little bit. For sure, the two-state solution is dead. Mm -hmm. That we actually see the Israelis and the Americans, I believe, facilitating this ultimate one-state solution, which is what you're saying, which is, in fact, where Christians, Muslims, and Jews can live, as they did before 1948, in a, this multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic environment. And I'm much more optimistic that this is going mm -hmm. to occur than you are, because mm -hmm. we see that the edifice, this building called Zionism, is crumbling. Mm -hmm. And we see signs of it all the time. Even though the Israelis are building settlements, they can't get people to move there. Mm -hmm. People are moving out. They don't want to live there. The economy cannot be self-sustaining mm -hmm. in Israel. It has to be built on all this foreign aid that's coming from the United States, the billions of dollars. I happen to be more optimistic. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I, okay. Um, I wanna, what I want to do is I want to go to one last clip of uh, Laura Lyons. She's professor of English. And uh, that was, um, she was the moderator on that mm -hmm. forum. And then we can go and discuss that okay. and what she also said on that, because she might be agreeing uh, with you or at least in, the, in that particular spirit. We go to that one. 
Well, I'm going to do the most obvious thing, which is to quote, quote Gramsci, right? Which is, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And, cool. and also just in relation to people saying there's nothing that we can do about the situation in Palestine. I, I personally do believe there is something we are obligated to do, and that is to register our dissent with the government's policies. And that that is absolutely a crucial act of resistance, because without that dissent, being registered in whatever forum possible, history will only continue to be written in a particular way. And as we've seen in the case of Hawaii, right, you know, historians doing careful archival work find a different story. And it's important for us to create that archive of dissent through the actions that we take as people who pay taxes to this government. Okay, well, you and I pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I mean, she's making a very good point. I actually agree with her because yeah. I, I am optimistic and yeah. I'm, I, I don't get pessimistic about this at all. And people might incorrectly see that I'm, I'm, I'm actually pessimistic. I'm not at all. I'm very optimistic. I'm optimistic because the, the intensity and the breadth and the depth of Palestinian resistance is so deep. The commitment to self-determination is so clear, is so unambiguous. And you know, in Arabic, uh, we have this word called samud, mm. which... Steadfast. Yeah, steadfast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've talked to Palestinians who are 85 years old and five years old, and they say, I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, this is my land, this is my home, and we're going to return. If we return next week, great. If it's next year, okay, but we're going to return. Mm -hmm. So there is steadfastness. One thing that Laura said, which is very true, however, and it's related to the taxes thing, it's only the United States that can bring any kind of resolution or peace mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's really between Israelis and Palestinians anymore. This is truly an American issue. Mm -hmm. As long as the United States foreign policy and, and, the, and the believes that it's in the American interest to subject Palestinians to occupation, they will continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they figure it out that this is immensely destructive for Americans, immensely destructive for American foreign policy, and immensely destructive for American interests, only then will they, you know, you know, say, okay, as we say in Arabic, yeah. khalas. Khalas. It's that's over. It. That's Enough. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's good. Um, you know, but uh, what uh, I'm saying is that... Uh, we're going to go through a period of more destruction and yes. so forth uh, before this thing um, would happen. Because what it requires also is a lot of uh, Jews, Israeli Jews especially, who would uh, fight for just peace and uh, hopefully um, a nonviolent uh, yes. um, method of getting to that uh, peace so that we can all live uh, you know, in harmony, so to speak, uh, if there is some such thing, but at least in a, in a peaceful, just way that, uh, you know, everybody can interact together. And I think Jews of conscience are doing that. Yeah. I think if, if Jewish Americans and Israelis will read Ilan Pape, even read Benny Morris, if they actually go to the West Bank or to Gaza and see the reality mm -hmm. of what an occupation is and they open up their heart and start living and stop living in darkness and fear, they too will come to see that what they're doing is, is grotesque and horrific right. yeah. and they can begin their own process of decolonizing their own right. minds. Right, absolutely, yeah. Because uh, then uh, they should also read about uh, Arabs, Christians, Muslims, Palestinians and so forth. So we're uh, practically flat out of time. Thank you for coming and thank you viewers for uh, watching and see you next month. Aloha. That was very good. You thought it was okay? Uh, okay.